Yeah, hopefully the mic's not going to be picking up too much wind, but it's not that windy, so it should be pretty good. I'd left off saying I was going to talk about the link and sequences side of the, what's going on in string here. And especially since there's quite a lot I've noticed here. Uh, when I was doing things originally, I didn't even fully recognize that there were actually similarities to Link. And in some cases, this strictly follows the Link pattern. In other cases, not exactly, but it's still super close. And regardless, it should be following Link conventions. So, since Link is... Well, it's not exclusively a .NET thing anymore, but it's it definitely originated in .NET, and that's where it's most widely known, and that's where one of the more important parts of it uh, shows up in, in... Link can be thought of as two things. The first is a set of extension methods which are used to implement its functionality. Now, you can call those extension methods regardless through a fluent-like syntax, and it's still highly readable, and it does what you want it to. This essentially winds up working like function composition, you know, chaining the, 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 the functions through each other. Um, just the syntax is a little bit different. In object-oriented languages, you tend to go with a more fluent design rather than a pipeline operator for functions. But either way, the, the effect is the same. You're taking the output from one into the other and you build up these queries through that. And sometimes, not specifically queries, sometimes it's just general transformations or, or whatever, but um, it it's almost database-like. That's, that's why it tends to be called queries, and that's why it focuses on that. The other side of link, which I can't really implement, I'll discuss why, but it's a pairing between Oh, what is it, iQueryable and the iQuery provider or something? Uh, I, I haven't ever actually implemented Link. I've tried to wrap my head around it a few times, but it's involved. And what those allow you to do is actually use the formal Link syntax, which is part of the language. Um, obviously, I would not be able to do that with string or really any of the text types because... They're not my types. I don't control them. I'd have to convince Microsoft to add interfaces to their stuff, and then I'd have to put tons of my stuff in their runtime, which would be fine. We've got compatible licenses, but there's no way in hell you're going to convince Microsoft to do that. Um, I shouldn't say that. It depends on who exactly addresses the issue at that particular time, but it's still probably not going to happen. I had to backtrack a little on that because there are some guys on the uh, .NET team who are adamant that string is a primitive and shouldn't be implementing any interfaces and shouldn't be ex implementing any uh, advanced functions because it should be viewed strictly as a primitive. Because I get it, it's technically a UTF-16 code sequence. It should not be viewed as a textual type. But it is, and you guys never implemented a non-primitive type to be using instead, and tons of things got implemented for string that make it really not a primitive anymore. Um, it's going to potentially convince them to add iQueryable to that, but you'd also... I mean, you don't really have a choice when it comes to the read-only span of car. You can't implement the interface, and uh, I don't believe the link uh, expression behavior is pattern matched. I'm pretty sure that has to go through the interface, but I'm not. I'm not certain. Don't hold me to that. So, what I'm doing, obviously enough, is just the the extension method side of that, the fluent syntax. But that's fine. That's that's what I'm doing anyways. I'm building up a large collection of extension methods for text processing. So, cool. 
Now, this is going to sound super weird, but because because I didn't realize that some of these were very Link-like in the first place, I missed out on a useful optimization in that the method names were wrong. I haven't lost my mind. I'm not drunk right now. I'm drinking coffee, not alcohol. Yes, proper naming of methods can lead to optimizations. Not in the normal case at all. Uh, in order for this to make any sense, you have to have an idea of how method resolution in C Sharp, Visual Basic, and F Sharp works. They preferentially select instance methods over extension methods, but then within each of those, they preferentially select the most specialized method. So if you have a method that is declared for your exact type rather than something lower down in your uh, inheritance uh, chain, it's going to preferentially select that. If you have a instance method or a, a, a method that works on specific instances rather than on generics, it's going to preferentially select that. And within generics, it is going to preferentially select the most specialized generic. Make sense? So we have this whole order of specialization that it relies on. This is where we get into optimizations. Method resolution has to have the same name. It can't have the it can't figure that out based on different signatures because even if the signatures are the are based on identical signatures, because even if the signatures are identical, if the name's different, it's probably because it's doing a different thing. So it has to have the same name. Now, if you were using the names that mine already had, then you're not going to see uh, any op... You're already getting the optimal performance. Should make sense. But people who are familiar with Link, and if you're using .NET, you probably are familiar with using Link. You're going to want to use the names that are already there. And that means you'd be missing out. See, using the, the same naming conventions as Link has isn't just an optimization thing. It's also a discoverability and learnability thing. Following that exact same convention, since my stuff is essentially doing the same thing, makes it so that there's far less to learn, which is fantastic. That's the same reason why Glyph is designed in the same way as Rune and Car because there's less to wrap your head around. It is essentially the same thing all over again. That's fantastic. So was I using the same names in all these situations? No. No. There were some where I definitely was. Contains is certainly an example of that. But then I went and did the contains anything, and... There really should have been just any. See, this is where we get into some minor differences, but essentially it's still so similar that the intention would be obvious. Any in Link accepts a Lambda, a delegate. Is it a delegate? Well, I guess it could accept a delegate, but it's meant for accepting a Lambda. You provided a function. That function is executed on every single element in the uh, in the uh, sequence. And as long as at least one of them holds up, then the any is satisfied. Now, what was contains any being used for? Well, essentially the same thing, but removing the lambda, which actually is a one hell of an optimization. Instead of a lambda that needs to be satisfied, it was a specific thing to look for, just like with contains. But the behavior was a little bit different. See, with contains any, you gave it a set of things, and it just had to contain any of them. So it's going to go through, as long as any of the characters within the sequence satisfy 
any in the set, then it holds true. You can extend this to all as well. For all, as in as long as all of the characters within the sequence satisfy at least one of the characters within the set, you've got all. And you can extend this to um, Unicode categories as well. So does any satisfy that category, or as long as all satisfy that category? Should make sense. The semantics of this method really aren't all that different. Would it be usable exactly in a link situation? Well, sort of. If you're doing link stuff otherwise, and you happen to, at the end of the call uh, chain before that point, you still have an I enumerable of character, or an I enumerable of rune would be allowable in that situation. I don't know why you would have one of those. You can normally just work with the characters directly. That's what I'm trying to do as an optimization, not force uh, specific encoding. Then you'd still be able to see that extension. You'd hit dot and start typing, and that extension will come up with the others. If you happen to already be using the Lambda, would you get any optimization out of it? No, the signature's different. The method resolution would not know to look for the other thing. Uh, potentially, you could write an analyzer that could identify those types of situations and recommend that you don't use a use one of the overloads that doesn't utilize the lambda. That would uh, obviously yield the optimization, but writing analyzers is not. It's tricky. I don't entirely think Roslyn has the best API. I think. We'll, I'll get into that more when I have an actual example that I can a counter example that I can I can show better designed API for doing what they're doing, but um, they're not terribly hard to write. So you could provide that analyzer. Now something else that I've noticed while I was in there, and this is a definitely happening thing. Sometimes you've got a sequence of characters and you want to see if a specific rune is within it. And this would typically be because you, you know, you got a sequence of characters and, you know, the, the, the go-to rune I usually have is like the G clef because you can't represent that with a single character. So you want to see if there's a G clef anywhere within that sequence. If you were to do that by a contains car, not going to work. You can't put that in a character for the, in the first place. But also, even if you were to search for its surrogates, that doesn't mean those surrogates were paired correctly. So do you, just for those specific instances, write your own search that does it based on... Um, you know, going through and seeing if the high surrogate is immediately followed by the low surrogate? Because doing that on sequences, especially I enumerable, which you can't randomly index into, is, I mean, it's not super difficult, but it's a little less obvious than if you had um, the ability to index anywhere into it. It's okay. Now, I could provide the overloads, which do that, but there's a better way. See, this kind of thing would need to be done repeatedly. The enumerators for runes, they work by reading the sequence of characters. Now, in the two specific examples where the, the rune enumerators were already implemented, these sequences were a string and a read-only span of car. But at no point does it require random indexing. The only thing you need to enumerate uh, the runes in a sequence is for it to be a sequence of characters. Now, this would not open up the possibility for using 
I enumerable of car as a text type. That is stupid. The performance implications of that are horrible. You should never do that. And I'm going to enforce that by not allowing that as an API choice. But the link side of these, that makes perfect sense. I can provide that enumerator. That enumerator would be available for consumption by other people. You can provide the get enum uh, enumerate runes extension method for the sequence. But also would be able to utilize that same enumerator in the implementation of these various link-like methods. So you could do contains rune, and it just utilizes the enumerator, and if it finds the rune, then, you know, that boom, you've got it. That simplifies my own code. Now, if I only had one situation where I ever needed to do this, I wouldn't bother with it. But there are multiple situations where this is a valid thing to do. And it just makes sense to actually have... Uh, an enumerator provided that I can reuse and other people would have access to. Another example of these link-like methods turned out to actually be join. Now, join is a particularly interesting one because it it's a showcase of why Link has some of the deservedly bad reputation that it has. See, Link is slow as all fuck. Sort of. The Link base is slow as all fuck. And the reason for that is because the overwhelming majority of performance optimizations actually rely on assumptions and making sure those assumptions are valid. You know, uh, invalid assumptions lead to bugs. Um, there's, there's really no other way to put it. If, you're, if you've optimized something but it doesn't work right, that's not a valid optimization. You fucked up. You introduced bugs into your code base. But okay, they're based on assumptions. So Link in general is general. It can't make any assumptions. That's why it works on innumerables, which you can't even assume you can immediately know the count of. You can't in assume that you can index into them. That's why the performance is bad. There are other reasons, of course. The whole process of continuously creating new sequences is expensive. But actually thinking about it, there's actually a clever way around that. Um, this is just an aside, but linked containers have a very clever way around that. Oh my god. I have to do some tinkering at some later point. <laughs> Anyways, back to what I was talking about. Uh, remember what I said about method resolution, though? The, the methods are resolved based on the most specialized. See, Link was designed this incredible general way as a matter more of convention than of a complete, viable, finished thing. You optimize Link by providing more specialized uh, overloads of the methods that are already in Link. Now, in a non-niche case, you would do specializations like, and some of these already are in the base class library, but uh, specializations like for count. Count on an enumerable, you don't know that the container or, or collection already has a known length. It may be a generator, which doesn't have an end point at all. Oh, calling count on that is a really bad idea. 
Oh my god. That's a design problem with Link thinking about it. Holy crap. <laughs> but what Count has to do in those situations is iterate through the entire thing. That's why on generators it's a bad idea. Keep a counter that it increments every single iteration. And then on completion returns the counter. Makes sense, right? Well, for collections that you know the length of, because the length is a field inside the collection and you track it, you have a count property that you can get that field through. You can specialize by overloading a count for, say, a collection of the same type. And it would be fine in this instance. You don't need to know the type. So it would be fine in this instance to have that method, that count, also be generic, but the generic parameter being of the collection type rather than the enumerable type. You now have access to the count property. You will now get the field value rather than enumerate through the entire thing, counting all the iterations. You see why that's, that's an optimization, but also you see how that's literally nothing more than just providing the extension. There are libraries that take advantage of this. I won't be including any as dependencies in Stringier because that's not really the point. Uh, plus, some of them are incompatible or need to introduce their own specific APIs to utilize their functionality. But it just sort of goes to, to, to contribute to towards what I'm what I'm doing and that there is a valid reason to be doing these kinds of things. There are link optimizers, things like hyperlink or fast link. Um, there's even a very specialized one called value link. The idea behind all of them, though, is that they provide these kinds of specializations. Uh, in the case of value link does the very interesting thing of in introducing its own API that you call it through, but utilizing value types and convention to provide that link interface. It's really only useful in situations where you've benchmarked your link queries and know for a fact that the primary uh, reason for the performance issues has to do with uh, memory pressures. You don't want to use that in the majority of cases. And I will not be utilizing that technique in optimizing anything. It's not worth it. Probably. But it does go to show that link optimizers are totally a valid thing. Stringier will just be having a very highly specialized form of them. Not general like hyperlink and fastlink does, but strictly for text. So that also means that all of the link overloads will not be provided because some of them simply don't need to be at all. Count is a fantastic example of that. The count optimizers are already provided. You don't get anything about specializing them for a specific type. But you do get them in other situations. Join being the fantastic example. Now, some of these behaviors, some of these optimizations, all that crap, are done by not strictly following link conventions. Join, for example, is meant to return another I enumerable. But that's not what I want to do at all. I want to join them into a string. Now again, these, these queries are still provided on string. So even after you join it, you'll still be able to do additional queries. But you see where that, that goes. Join isn't just meant for I enumerables either. There are all sorts of optimizations. In some cases, the most optimal thing to do is return the exact same type. Join of a string. Because remember, string itself is an I enumerable of car. Or join for a read-only span of car is itself can still conceptually a sequence, even though it doesn't implement that interface. 
join semantics makes sense for them. They are sequences. But you wouldn't want to actually do anything. You want to just return, in the spans case, itself, and in the strings case. I mean, you could just return itself, but for orthogonal APIs, remember what I said in the last video, if it allocates a new thing, it makes sense to return string. But otherwise, you're going to be taking a slice of that, uh, literally of the entire, so just conversion to a span, of the entire string. There's nothing to join. It is technically already joined as far as the semantics within stringier goes. So don't do anything. By providing that API, usage of join in link queries can recognize that and not do the stupid join that it does by default because it can't make assumptions. But there are other instances where this you know, in between points. Join for an array, for example. Actually, no. It used to be a little bit different, but really, now it's not. Because now you would just return the span. Yeah, that's fantastic. We've got a lot of optimal cases. Join for sequences of strings. You can't do that anymore, though. So... This is actually a useful example. If it's an unenumerable of string, you have to default to the almost same assumptions that the link has in the first place. You don't know what the total length of that is, so you have to use a string builder or similar API to actually construct the entire thing. Should make sense. However, however, Join for an array of strings. You can actually fast calculate the length of that. It is iterations over it, but iterations through an array are very fast. Sum the length, create an array of that length. Do your copies into that array. Boom. You've got it. Return that array as a new string. You're done. That is a hell of a lot faster than using a string builder and iterating over the entire thing. So you can see where that that goes. I, it's funny, I, I intended the, the version 4 of Stringier to be more of a um, API change than anything, but there wound up being so many fantastic uh, opportunities for optimization and um, you know, some of the motivations and kind of racing uh, and getting v4 out uh, at or a little before uh, .NET 5 comes out, and granted, I want that primarily for the uh, performance showdown with the regex improvements that they're doing, but uh, these, you know, pa the patterns engine is actually built on top of core. It's it's not its own thing separate from it. It actually utilizes some of the stuff within core and will increasingly utilize those um, since. As part of this audit, I actually noticed I have some duplication that should never have existed. So I've been working that out. And the patterns engine is probably going to work a little differently internally and wind up utilizing what's in core a bit more. So you definitely want it optimal because. I don't want to be shown up by Microsoft. I'm already generally outperforming them on that, especially as far as memory usage goes. But even performance, there are many situations where I was outperforming them, or at least competitive with them. I'd like to keep it that way. So, 
I'm not sure if there's going to be a third part to this. Let's see if... Actually, no. I know for a fact there will be a third part of this because there are some changes that I need to describe with regard to Unicode categorization. Because there are some changes that I already made and some changes I may additionally make. Seriously. The .NET runtime didn't even get Unicode categorization right. I wish I was fucking kidding. It's not that a category is wrong, but there are issues with the approach. I'll, I'll get into that. But there are further improvements I'd like to do beyond what UAX 44-5.7.1 does. So, we'll talk about that. So that'll be the third entry in this series. I don't know if there's going to be more, but a lot of changes to even just the core that are coming. This is a big audit. A lot more going on than the previous audits. So until then, have a good one, guys.